Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexis, Development Manager here at NZN. So glad to see you. Um, today we've got a very special edition of the Science on Screen program. We can thank our uh, nationally funded uh, grantors, the Sloan Foundation and the Coolidge Corner Theater for uh, these funds that we get to present the greatest adaptations linking science and art. Um, we've got a speaker today that has actually spoken at a past Science on Screen presentation. Was anyone here to see Deep Impact at NZN by any chance? Okay, well you all will get to be wowed by Dr. Josh Colwell for the very first time, as I will be as well. Dr. Josh Colwell is a planetary scientist and professor of physics at the University of Central Florida. Since 2011, he has been associate chair of the Department of Physics, assistant director of the Florida Space Institute, and director of the Center for Microgravity Research at UCF. He might tell us what all this means if we're lucky today. He came to UCF in 2006 from the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado, where he earned his PhD in Astrophysical, Planetary, and Atmospheric Sciences. So rest assured, he is qualified to explain the incredible phenomenon that we'll see in Primer today. Has anyone see, seen Primer already? Oh, wow. Give yourselves a hand. Check that out. That's amazing. Um, OK, so you've already got a leg up on me. His research interests are in the origin and evolution of the solar system, with a particular emphasis on planet formation, asteroids, planetary rings, comets, and interplanetary dust. He is co-investigator on the ultraviolet imaging spectrograph on the Cassini mission, a spacecraft orbiting and exploring Saturn from 2004 to 2017. He studies the structure and dynamics of Saturn's rings with data from Cassini. His experiments have flown on the space shuttle, the International Space Station, suborbital rockets, parabolic airplane flights, and he is developing a CubeSat for launch in 2018. An avid Trekkie, his other interests include running, writing, and movies. He's the author of The Ringed Planet, produces and hosts the astronomy podcast, Walk About the Galaxy, and he was a comment advisor for an actor in the DreamWorks picture, Deep Impact. So please, without further ado, give a warm welcome to Dr. Josh Colwell of UCF. Thanks very much. Thank you. See, I was, I was anticipating that show of hands. Actually, let me do the reverse question and ask for a show of hands of who has not seen the movie yet. This seems like it's a roughly 50-50 mix. Um, those of you who have seen it, I'll just go ahead and tell you that I cannot promise any brilliant, magical answers at the end of the movie. Um, and for those of you who have not yet, I won't uh, give away, uh, I don't want to do any spoilers before the movie, and there is uh, time after the movie for some Q&A if you want. So beforehand, I just wanted to spend a few minutes talking about time travel in general, in science fiction and in reality. And so it's a wonderful, uh, technique or mechanism to use in storytelling because it gives you all sorts of intriguing possibilities and plot devices that you can use to do some very fun things. And basically, you can have the four different sort of modes of time travel that I've got listed here. Maybe I didn't think of one, but you can go forward in time, see the future, uh, travel backward and see the past. You can travel backward and change the past, uh, or go forward, back and forth, uh, so go forward, see the future, come back, and do something to change what's going on in the future. So from a physicist standpoint, uh, what do we think about time travel? Well, you're probably familiar with uh, those of you who have seen the movie and maybe everybody here with the sort of general idea that time can be thought of as a dimension like our spatial dimension. So here in the room, we're experiencing three spatial dimensions, and time is a dimension as well, but it's a special dimension because we only can move through time in one direction, whereas I can move in the spatial dimensions in any direction. I can go left or right, up or down, forward or back. Uh, time is a little bit different that way, but uh, the equations that describe the shape of the universe and how gravity works and Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, time is one dimension along with the three spatial dimensions that we're used to 
and you include time in the description of how the universe works and how gravity works uh, and the motion of objects. And the two bullets that I've got here on the bottom uh, is something that I go over in my intro physics classes when we talk about special relativity. We have a bias towards thinking of things based in a spatial sense. We're used to spatial reference frames. I'm going to the Enzian Theater from my house. Where is it? It's 10 miles in a certain direction. And I, therefore, thinking about things in a spatial coordinate system and reference frame. And, I, and because of the world that we live in and the way that we uh, interact with that world, that works all the time. But it's not the way the universe is really built. The universe is built not on a foundation of position, but on a foundation of speed. The one underlying pillar, the immutable constant of the universe is the constancy of the speed of light. And uh, that's the thing that ties everything together. It's not a grid of where things are, it's a speed of how things can move. And because of that, and because of this idea that time is a dimension, we actually are all traveling in time. And you know this, this is trivial, but let's travel forward in time by two seconds. Ready? Go. 1001, 1002. We did it. We're in the future. Not hard, okay? So we can all travel forward in uh, time. And in fact, we can't avoid traveling forward in time. The universe obligates us to move through the mixture of spatial and temporal dimensions at the speed of light. So we've got an allocation, basically, of you shall move through four-dimensional space-time at the speed of light. And you can choose how you want to divvy that speed up between moving through space or moving through time. So if I'm standing still here, I'm not moving through space at all, that means all of my allocation from the universe to move through space-time is going in the temporal dimension. So I'm moving forward, and we're all now moving forward in time at the speed of light. If I start moving through space very fast, then I've got less speed left over to move through time. And I will therefore have time pass more slowly for me. And this means that I can actually travel forward in time in the science fiction-y sense, not just in the boring sense that we're all doing right now. So if I use my allocation of I can go at the speed of light through space-time, and I say, let me use 99% of that to go through the spatial dimensions, I've only got 1% left over to go through time. And this is time dilation in Einstein's theory of special relativity, and it's a frequently used device in, time, in uh, science fiction where there's a, you get in a spaceship that goes very fast, and you come back home, and you've only aged a month, and everybody else has aged a year, or 10 years, or 100 years, or 1,000 years, depending on how fast you are going through space. So that whole thing can just be thought of as I'm moving through these four dimensions of space and time, and if I choose to move faster through space, I will move slower through time. And moving slower through time means my clock goes slower than everybody else's. And I can go forward in, in, in time that way. So here I've got some astounding visuals here for you. So here's, I've wrapped all our three spatial dimensions into one, and then time. And so if you're stationary, you're just moving through time. And so here's one hour. If I'm moving through space as well, then this arrow here is the same length as this arrow. So for one arrow, for one hour for you guys in the room, if I'm traveling very fast this way, I'm going from, say, my house to the Enzian very fast, near the speed of light, you measure an hour go by. But for me, this distance is shorter than this distance. Only half an hour has elapsed, OK? Then I can turn around and come back and uh, meet you, and I will have aged less than you guys. So this is a way, literally, to travel forward in time in the science fiction-y sense. So what goes on in uh, this movie is, uh, and 
uh, I won't really give any spoilers, and it's hard to give spoilers in the movie because it's kind of incomprehensible. <laughs> um, so when you're, for those of you who have not seen it before, I would say relax, don't worry about trying to follow every twist and turn. There's a lot of information that the filmmakers deliberately left out of the movie. This was uh, written, directed, and starring uh, a gentleman named Shane Carruth, who has some training in engineering and physics and made this movie on a shoestring budget. And I think it's a really clever idea, and he did a very uh, admirable job of putting together a movie, this movie on a shoestring budget. And the basic idea is these two sort of garage hackers accidentally invent a time machine. And I don't think I'm spoiling anything to say that the way that machine works is you turn it on at a particular time, and then at some later time, if you get in it, say I turn it on over there at 12 o'clock, and I wait an hour, and then I get in the machine at 1 o'clock, and then I spend an hour in the machine. While I'm in the machine, I go back in time to the time the machine was turned on. And then I can step out of the machine, and I have now traveled back in time to the time the machine turned on. Inconveniently, it took me an hour to do that. I had to spend an hour to go back in time. Most uh, travel back in time science fiction, you go through a door or a portal or whatever, some kind of fancy stargate, and it's like, I'll just go back to 1927, and there you are. With this particular time machine, you'd have to spend 90 years in that machine to go back to 1927 from 2017. One thing I will, uh, and again, I don't really think of any of this as a spoiler, but one other thing that took me a little while to figure out, and I think I have this right, and those who have seen the movie can correct me in the Q&A after if I have it wrong, is I turn the machine on at 12, and suppose I get in it at 1, and then suppose I don't, and I spend more than an hour in it, what happens? So my understanding is if I spend, let's say, four hours in it instead of one hour, I would go from one o'clock back to noon, back to one, that's two hours, back to noon, that's three hours, back to one, that's four hours, and I get out and from your standpoint, looking at me, I would have stepped into the box and stepped out of the box in no time, but I would have wasted four hours and would be four hours older. That was not something that was not, and I think that's right, was not clear to me while watching the movie. Of course, there's all sorts of delightful things that happen with traveling back in time. I'm going to wrap up so we can start the movie right now. But it can create sort of all sorts of fun paradoxes that these guys worry about once they start time traveling. What happens, you know, of course, if you go back in time and uh, prevent your parents from meeting each other or whatever. So you can have all sorts of fun paradoxes that are commonly exploited in time travel movies. And one thing just about the sort of physics, we said it's perfectly allowable to go forward in time. Time is dimension, but it has the special directionality to it. Going backwards in time poses problems not just for sort of mind-bending paradoxes, but Suppose I turn the machine on at 12, and then at 1 o'clock I get in it, and it, I wait an hour, and I step out at 12. Well, now there's two of me there. Where did that extra me come from? This is a fundamental problem of violating our understanding of the laws of nature with traveling back in time is now I've just created 75 kilograms of new matter out of nothing. That is a gigantic amount of energy that just popped into existence. So uh, without any further uh, generalizations, as I said, for those of you who haven't seen it before, uh, don't worry too much about trying to understand everything that's going on, but pay attention to the party aspect of things and the girlfriend aspect of things. But for the most part, just enjoy, and uh, it'll be fun to talk about it afterwards, I think. Thanks, enjoy the movie. The last thing I'll say is that after the film, we'll have a microphone set up on uh, near the doors so that um, as confused as you are, you can let out some of that frustration at Dr. Caldwell. Um, I lied. That wasn't the last thing I'll say. The last thing I'll say is this morning I was talking with Dr. Caldwell, and he said, you know, after the movie, I was thinking that maybe I could invent a time machine, go back in time, and deny your request for me to speak at this movie 
because everyone's going to be so confused. So enjoy, have a great time, and we'll speak with you afterwards. We're going to give Dr. Colwell just one moment to gather himself, uh, hide his doppelganger, and then we'll get started. So the amazing news is we just got word last week that we've received another year, another 12 months of funding from the Sloan Foundation and the Coolidge Corner Theater to continue this program. So make sure that you rack your brains, think of any questions that Dr. Colwell might be able to answer. I'm sure he's qualified to you know, answer them all. And um, we'll turn the mic back over to the expert. Thanks. What did you guys think? Those of you that had first time through, it's a pretty interesting move. That definitely the second time through, uh, it's easier. <laughs> can say that. Who's seen it here more than two times? Some diehard <laughs> primer. How many do you've gone, you just keep going back, get in the box, come out, watch the movie, then get in the box, go back, watch the movie, yeah. Um, so, for those of you uh, who aren't aware of this, there are a number of explainer videos for this movie on YouTube, um, and some of them are pretty good, uh, and there's a lot of things in the movie that I think are left uh, without enough information in the movie for you to come up with a definitive explanation for. Um, but. Uh, I'd be happy to hear anybody's comments or, or questions or talk about what's going on. And the general picture is Abe. First time I watched, I couldn't even keep track of who was Abe and Aaron. That's how messed up I am. Uh, so Abe, the light-haired one, builds the box first, and he builds two boxes. And he turns one on before the other one. The first one is the fail-safe on the second floor. And then the second one is the one he uses to try to make money with the stock market. And then he does it and he goes back and he tells Aaron and he shows him, see there I am getting out. And then if things work properly, you turn on the box, they, he turns it on with a delay, right? So he, he starts a timer so that the box will turn on in 15 minutes because he's gonna be getting out of it as soon as the box turns on and he doesn't wanna meet himself. So he turns it on with a delay goes off, hides in a hotel room, comes back eight hours later, gets in the box, goes backwards in time and gets out at 8.15, 15 minutes after his other person has left, has turned off the box and left the room to go to the hotel room. Then that person uh, goes and makes money on the stock market and then at the time that, uh, and, and during that day there's two of them, right? There's the one that's hiding in the hotel room and one who's out using the information that that first guy got on the stock market to make money. And then once the one in the hotel room goes back in the box again, you're back to just one person, one Abe. And so if you just did that once, that one time, after that one weird day is over, things would be normal and okay. Then obviously things get complicated, <laughs> to say the least. They start having problems for some reason and I, I'd be curious to hear anybody's thoughts on this. They get very excited about the idea of going back and punching some guy in the face just for the fun of it. And that's worth risking all sorts of misery with spending 10 hours in the box in the middle of the night and risking who knows what kinds of temporal paradoxes, but just for the satisfaction of punching that guy in the face. Uh, and uh, then they have these various problems, the ear bleeding, the hand problems, and at some point, Abe gets in the fail safe three days and 22 hours after he had turned it on. 
Um, so that's at like three in the mo that three in the morning or something. He goes and gets all that oxygen and the drugs or whatever, so he can survive for almost four days. Gets in there, goes back to before his original money making box turns on. Gets up on the roof, sees Aaron down there, listening to what he thinks is March Madness, but is actually a recording that that copy of Aaron had made of everything that happens that day. Goes down there, and you know, you, you know, the second time through, I caught that Aaron is like saying the answers to the things that Abe is not saying. <laughs> Abe is supposed to say, you know, are you doing anything useful at work today? He's like, hey, how can you say that anything isn't a useful day at my company or whatever? But Abe has just spent four days in the box with no food and drugs and everything, and he's not saying the right things and passes out. Anyway, um, it's. Uh, interesting and then at the end, the voiceover is one of the versions of Aaron calling another version of Aaron. That one version has gone off. The other version at the end, I guess, is in France building a warehouse sized version of the box. Then one version of, there's two versions at least, I guess, of Abe back home, wherever that is, one going about his business building the box incorrectly because the other Abe has sabotaged it, and that other Abe is there surveilling things. Aaron wonders why he's staying there, what possible use you have. Of course, that's a version of yourself that now is completely isolated and abandoned from your whole life and your family. It's like, well, why don't you go take your, <laughs> take your wife and daughter and put them in the box and go back, and then there can be a copy of you, and each one have a hemisphere, anything. But I thought it was, I thought it did a good job of exploring the kinds of paradoxes and issues that you come up with, with that kind of time travel. Comments or questions from those who have seen it more, more times than I have. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I've seen, I saw one that was sick. There, there's, it's actually, the YouTube explainer videos actually are very clever themselves in terms of how they sort of go through and reconstruct everything. Um, oh, on that note, uh, I just watched one yesterday by London City Girl that was illustrated. That was probably the clearest one I've seen so far. I, I would agree with that one. That was the, the ones I've watched, I thought. Yeah, she's pretty did a very good job. So, um, before we started the movie, you were talking about how when the second one came back that there was this extra energy. Well, right. If there's, so you come back, there's two copies of that person at that location in space time. So, That's mass equals energy. Right. So when you said that, my first idea was, was that, well, it, it or the energy or whatever came from another time. And since that doesn't normally happen in, in the natural universe, that there, it's an anomaly. So no, it wouldn't, but I don't know, I don't know any of this, but you, you, no, yeah. it wouldn't normally happen. But then it, uh, at the beginning of the movie, uh, the way he was, he was adjusting the energy and then taking the batteries off of it, I right. got the impression that, for lack of a better term, it was kind of a perpetual motion machine that, right. was, that was starting to go a little faster than the energy that was initially put into it. So I wondered if that ties into where that extra energy would eventually come from. You're asking me to explain how the thing actually works. No, yeah. no that's a real thing, right? Uh, I yeah, guess. no, I mean, that, that's, that's a good point. He disconnects the two batteries and the machine still runs for some period of time. Um, but, and but wouldn't, is that the filmmaker kind of explaining that, that there, is a, there is a way that extra energy is coming in even though they don't quite understand it and maybe that's why it comes in when there's two in the same timeline. I guess I, I think that, that he's definitely doing his best to sort of recognize and say, hey, we know this stuff plays around with what we understand is the way things normally work and the characters in the film recognize that and the filmmaker recognize that and that's one of the ways he shows that. It's like, yeah, we know that we're violating our normal concepts of conservation of energy. So they, and I appreciate that. That's them saying, hey, we get this. This doesn't make sense normally. Here it is, this is going on. And you know, that's for my, my 
perspective as a as a moviegoer, fine. I'm not you know interested in really trying to understand how the machine works. I'm like, what interesting things do you do with this? Um, conceit of the movie. And so I do think they were saying, yeah, there's something weird going on with energy. We're not going to explain it, but we recognize that there is something weird going on. Okay, is, great. Is, is that what you were getting I, at? Yeah, I guess I guess it comes down to my, my biggest question, which I was afraid to ask because we don't have hours. And, uh, and that's in your best way, the way you understand it. Where is that line drawn between the science and they, because there's a lot of science jargon they, they spill out. Yeah, in the first but part, there. Where's that line drawn between what they're saying is real science and that actually works that way and where it starts to turn into, you know, fantasy time travel? Like, where, what, well, where, pretty, what, what do they start leaving out and then go further, you know? I mean, pretty early on. I mean, they, they, the first part has a lot of technical language about superconductors. So they're, doing something with superconductor and the people who have a lot of money are using liquid helium to get things down because superconductors are materials where the resistance to electrical current essentially vanishes and all our known superconductors, that happens only at very low temperatures. And uh, it's an actual big challenge in physics and engineering to work on materials that are superconducting at higher temperatures, more manageable temperatures. So then, they are addressing that in their early, in the early garage scenes. And well, you know, we're just gonna get some magnets and do this thing and then we don't need to bring the temperature down and we'll have a room temperature superconductor. And that's just like when the Russians used a pencil instead of a very fancy pressurized pen. Uh, to write. It's a simple solution or whatever. You know, it's, we, we don't know how to make uh, really a room temperature superconductor and even if we did, they don't, there's no explanation in there about how now I got a room, temp, now I have a superconductor, somehow I'm canceling out uh, gravity. So they're, my understanding is they think they're making some kind of basically anti-gravity machine. What they're looking at, what they're measuring of the Weeble is its mass and they see its mass go from 7.7 .7 decagrams to 6.7 and uh, so that's which, which, what they were intending to do, and then they discover that actually it has this weird time effect, and gravity and time are related. Ta-da! So, um, so they're breaking the law of ma ma energy or mass can't be created or destroyed; it can only be like redistributed. They're breaking that law, kind of. Well, there's not there's not enough information in the movie to put your finger on it and say. It all makes physical sense up to this point in, in time, right? There's, there's a lot of true technical jargon that goes on, and then at the end of that, there's a, an, a machine that as we know it today is impossible. So, you know, you, you could like, I could give a completely true lecture on physics, and then at the end say, and here's my transporter. So where did I, you know, where did I cross the line of from science fact to science fiction when I said, and here's my transporter. So it's when they like, and here's my machine that cancels gravity and time. One thing I thought that was interesting though that I didn't think about the first time through that your question made me think of, when, so the box turns on at like 8.15, he gets in at like four and sets, or six hours later sets a timer, right? and uh, gets out as the machine is ramping up from being turned on, right? So it, it's turned on at 8.15, it goes So he's like getting out at that time. As, before he gets out, he's moving backwards through time. Then he just opens the door and stumbles out, and now he's moving forwards through time. And as soon as he's moving forwards through time, the person that he was a second ago is in the box, moving backwards through time to get to that turnaround point. And where did that, you know, he even says this. He's like, well, you know, a copy of me is in there now waiting to get out. Mechanically, that seemed a little bit weird, right? He's just like, the door opens, you stumble out. Okay, is there now immediately 
one in there? When, you know, how does that happen? One minute later, his self is there. I thought that was a little bit sort of hand wavy for those guys. Otherwise, it made perfect sense. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Melody. Uh, so, what time, when was this supposed to be set? And was there a budget issue? It was budget. It was budget. Well, it was made in 2000. I think it was filmed in 03. It went to Sundance in 03 or 04. Um, and I think it was filmed on 16 millimeter film. And uh, so we noticed. And technology has changed a lot in the last 14 years, so their laptops are adorably clunky. And uh, um, but I think it was set at the time that it was filmed. I think. Okay, when was it set? Okay. It's hard for me to remember. Well, yeah, I mean. Right. So there's some there's some pretty old equipment in my lab at UCF. You know, it's not like we. So there's there's stuff in our lab that's 20 years old. Um, but yeah, okay. So a few years before it was made, it was, it, yeah. But it was made in '03. Uh, the number I heard was seven thousand dollar budget, which is remarkably cheap, um, even if you're just doing it yourself. Um, and my my daughter is out in L.A. an aspiring actor and filmmaker, and she made an independent movie on a real real shoestring, and it was. She probably spent fifty thousand dollars to make that movie, and you know that was that was just that's expensive to have. Now they, this was sixteen millimeter, and you can really see it in the night scenes. It's super super grainy because they didn't have either good film sen uh, low light sensitivity or. And I don't know if you said anything about that. I thought the the sh the scene at the fountain was very peculiar, and that was. I think the best example of him being Shane Carruth, the guy who plays Aaron, who's the writer and director, um, and also did the music, um, he of him sort of being deliberately, I'm going to make this hard on the audience. Because it's hard to see. I'm at a fountain. It's hard to hear. Like many of the scenes, you sort of cut to it in the middle of the conversation, and you don't know exactly what it is that they're talking about. Um, so... Yeah. I don't know if I answered your question in the end, but yeah. Other comments or question or anybody? Who is going to watch it again at some point? <laughs> and I think that's something that he has said. He's like, I want to make this so that you have to, I want people to want to go back and watch it again to figure out what's going on. And if you haven't done that already, I would recommend uh, The London City Girl. Uh, YouTube video is a good one. There was another one that's all text that I thought was pretty good and it sort of touches on different aspects of it. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the fountain scene, you notice at the very end of it, they say they're looking for a cat, which is not very likely because cats don't like water. You're making an assumption that Aaron, too, is the one who's giving the conversation to Abe. Okay, I couldn't even, so this is, and I listened very carefully this time, I couldn't even understand the word cat. <laughs> so I couldn't even hear what it was that they said that they were looking for. If you think about it, that's what he was doing there, is isolating him so that he's in a situation where he knows that Abe is going to be the Isolated from everything. Every, right. And it's, it's 
obvious what he's doing by the flimsy excuse of we're looking for my girlfriend's cat. Okay. <laughs> you watch the film several times and you start figuring out right. Aaron 2 and Aaron 4 has linear switch. Okay, which one? Who is the it's who is the one which version of Aaron is it that's leaving the phone message? Aaron two? Presumably Aaron four. Aaron four. Okay. There. <laughs> right. And then but uh, yeah. Yeah. You can yeah, you can map through I mean I it made me think in some ways about the HBO Westworld, where as you, after you watch it through, then you realize, oh, things are not presented linearly in time, and you're seeing the same people at different points in their timeline out of sequence, and it's a similar sort of thing that does make it fun to go back and, and watch it again. Yeah. It's also worth noting that the one scene that is so quick that most people don't notice it is when he talks about how many reflections he's seen in the Do they mention a number of rooms or? They mention the number of rooms that Aaron shows Abe, but it doesn't show them after. They just show okay. them touching the block. Well, he mentions it, yeah, it's not really a touch the block, so it's right. Is that the supposed to go into? So it's not designed to go get the party scene right. Right. Was it? Was it? One of those rooms on the floor is another permutation of them trying to get the party right. Right. Right, so he takes the. He, he goes into the original fail safe, he, he, he makes another time machine and he breaks it down and takes it with him so that he makes his own fail safe. Right, and which you can do over and over again. That's right. It takes a toll on you. <laughs> right. Uh huh. I guess every time you go back, you must have to take your own because you would have to use you could use the same time machine each time. The first time you use it. Only one person can be in there at a time. Unless you want to get a machine and everybody makes a new one, and you have to use that fail safe and it goes back again. Right. You want another one, you have to use that one. So you have to use this one at a time. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here's my question. Do all these people not? Do you think that they're not cloning themselves? So are there multiple errands? Are you speaking? Is this a philosophical question, or they? I mean, they are actually because because one Abe actually gases himself. So there's two physical Abes in the same room at the same time, and then Aaron goes and drugs himself with a milk bottle and picks up his body and carries it up into the attic. But it's still, I don't think it's more than one Abe. I think it's still the same Abe. It can exist in, literally it doesn't. They're the same. Ordinarily, you're doing a loop, right? They're breaking Well, but I mean, even, they're only, they're, it, it's not the premise of the movie that's preventing them from breaking, they're just like initially deciding we're going to be good and reasonable and behave ourselves and hide in a hotel room. But when they get out of the machine, that guy could just go to the hotel room and say, hi, Josh, I'm Josh. What's going to happen now, you know? Uh, and eventually, they do do that as things start breaking out. Kevin. Yeah. 
but yeah, I mean, there's, they're kind of like clones in, in the science fiction sense that we see in other movies. At the end, at the airport, Abe is gonna stay around to like surveil another Aaron and Abe while the other Aaron is going off to build uh, a, giant a giant box in France. Um, so there are multiples of them and they have had, they're different only in the sense that they've had different numbers of passes through history and therefore don't have identical experiences after the invention of, after the first box was turned on. There's not an infinite number because they actually have to go do it. They have to actually go get in a box and spend hours in there and pop out. And they could do that over and over and over again. I'm not. He disappears from the future that he would have. Right. And then, yeah, so here's, here's eight o'clock. I get out of a box. Uh, sorry, no, I don't want to do it that way. Here's eight o'clock. I turn on a box. Uh, then I go through time to four o'clock and I get in the box. I'm now no longer, me is no longer, is not going to be at five o'clock. I'm now travel back to eight o'clock, get out, make some money, and then if I were smart, and didn't care about punching a guy in the face or doing the shotgun thing at the party, then I would cruise on to five o'clock and there'd just be one of me and I would be rich. Because, because the other person of me at four o'clock had gone back in the box and it was not propagating forward through time anymore. Yeah. Right. As long as we get back in it. <laughs> right. Oh, then the first time, I think that was a, uh, yeah. Um, so suppose I turn on the box at eight, I go about my day uh, in the hotel, then I get in the box at four, and then I travel back in time to 8.15 or eight, and then I get out and there's one of me still going forward through the day in the hotel. This version of me could go and, well, I could like destroy the box, or I could lock that guy in the hotel then that guy doesn't, isn't this what you were getting to, is not able to get in the box to become me. So then, you know, that's the classic paradox, right? I stop in the past something from happening that led to me being able to be there in the first place. Brain explodes, right? That's when, yeah. Liam. So he, he spent, <laughs> did you see it? Oh, and, and it's more in, okay. Uh, that was, he, he worked on, oh, this is awesome, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he worked on some movie after this one that never got made, then he made this other one called, what's it called, Upstream Color? I haven't seen it. Yes, sir. Uh. Uh. I have 
Yay! <laughs> so you're only assuming that he has a body slam because Aaron is the one who's telling him that. You notice when they do actually go through it, one permutation that is shown, Aaron Abe wants to break the window to take the shotgun shells out, but Aaron stops him. Right. The shotgun shells. Right. It is reasonable to assume that the entire reason for Aaron bringing Abe along in this. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Hang on. You're assuming that Aaron is not lying about how many times he's done parties. He could have only been once. If he knows that he doesn't have to break the window, he stops Abe from doing it. It's obviously evident that it's Abe's first time going through the party, but not Aaron. Right. Yeah, I think they're assuming that they're saying that the reason it doesn't fire is because he doesn't have uh Yeah, but I think it's a different scenario with that like maybe like maybe without them it's all you know is that Aaron said that the reason that he doesn't fire he gives three reasons. What? They're assuming they're not lying. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean one I mean we see some number of fragments of some number of loops. And there could be many more loops, but we don't have any idea whether or not there were any more than the ones that we see. I mean, you can, we can speculate and create scenarios where every storage container at the U-Haul place has got a copy of somebody in it or whatever, but there's not enough information, in my opinion, in the movie to definitively answer some of these things, like what was the thing with Thomas Granger, exactly what happened to him, and so on. There's some very, I think, plausible explanations for that. And I haven't heard, there is a, I haven't listened to it, but Shane Carruth himself does an audio commentary of this. Has anybody listened to that? And does that add some? Yeah, he gives a lot of the insight of Uh -huh. <laughs> oh, another interesting thing that he said was like, um, he shot the entire movie linearly. So like, the first shot of the movie is the first thing that he shot, and the last thing that he shot is the last thing that he shot. Really um, that would be, yeah, I mean, that'd be a little bit surprising since, for example, there's multiple versions of the same scene with the same people that happen at very different times in what we see on screen. Like, so say for example, the conversation between him and Aaron on the bench, we see twice. If I'm making that movie, I film both of those at the same time. But apparently that's not the way that he's shot. That's One of many differences between me and him. <laughs> yeah. So, right, you made, you made the mention that if you were a smart, intelligent person, you would use your time machine, you would go through your 36-hour days, get back in, make your money, and keep on going. Right. You wouldn't have, at the very beginning of the movie, both Abe and Aaron are very censored, they're very focused people. And as the movie progresses, they start to unravel a bit. They have the fantasies of punching the guy in the face. They want to stop the shotgun issue at the party, which you can attribute to just mentally being able to handle over and over again going through these loops. But we also start seeing their physical issues. They can't write as well, the uh, bleeding out of the ear. Do you believe that maybe some of their unraveling, both you know, mentally, isn't just the 
because they're going through the loop, but also because of being in the field of the time machine itself? I guess I would say I think that's one of the things that I like about the movie is that it's rich enough in what's going on and also doesn't hold your hand with everything going through that, you know, what's happening is like real life, is complicated and sure, that's, they're, they are getting messed up and maybe that does explain some of the questionable decisions that they make. You think some uh, of the more questionable errands, for example, are the ones that have looped more and that's the one that so you said it was Aaron Four that's on the phone. Yeah. So I, you know, I don't know. One one thing I saw speculating was that their their problem with writing was because early on they stick their hands in the field that they're doing, and that screws up their hand body. Synchronization, it's just, it's speculation, unless the movie maker tells us otherwise, but. And then they go entirely in the field, so not just their hand, but their mental state starts to unravel a little bit too, and they're not the same people at all by the end that we're seeing that we started with. Going back to their th three, third grade self, where they really want to punch that guy in the face or something, yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Now I think that's a good point that at the beginning that's very clear. Well, how many patents are we going to get? How are we going to turn this into a marketable thing? Then they actually have a thing that accomplishes all those goals and then they start devolving into these sort of weird, uh, useless directions. Well, the sun has a strong magnetic field, as does, and then the planet, some of the planets have lesser magnetic fields. So, so that's how we get the speed of light, so to speak, because both, both are shooting something, they escape the sun, and light goes out. No, those are different things. So, um, what I, with, beforehand, when I had this little cartoon graph of things going through space and time, and we all have the allotment of moving through space time at the speed of light. Only one thing does move through space at the speed of light, and that's a photon, a, a light, a, a quanta of light. And if, since it's moving through space at the speed of light, that means it's not moving through time at all. Uh, everything else is moving through space slower than the speed of light and is therefore aging or moving through time. The, Photons and protons are very different things. So the sun's magnetic field, the sun, there's a solar wind from the sun, which is protons and electrons that are flowing outward from the sun. And uh, the sun has a magnetic field and it's rotating and that magnetic field permeates the solar system. And the charged particles that make up the solar wind, those protons and electrons are guided uh, by the sun's magnetic field. They hit the Earth, and the Earth's magnetic field directs them towards the poles, which gives us the aurora, the northern lights, and the southern lights. Um, light itself is a different, a different phenomenon. Okay, so our magnetic field here on Earth, is, it, is that what related to why they had to go in real time back? You're, so you're also asking me to explain how that thing actually really works, <laughs> and it doesn't. <laughs> so, you know, it's fun. They throw out a lot of fun, you know, jargon that a lot of it is based in real physics. And, uh, you know, and then presto, there's a magic time machine. Yeah. They skipped a few. They, they skipped a few. <laughs> he knows how to make a clever movie, but he doesn't actually know how to make a time machine. I agree, 100%. <laughs> yep. But I'm not educated enough to know how to get to that point. It just seems obvious. That's a, yeah, no, they're, they're using superconductivity and magnetic fields as just to say, here, we're doing something with physics. And we understand physics, and then 
something weird is going on with a battery, so we understand energy, and we're talking about these terms, and we built something that, you know, nobody's built before, and they're as surprised as we are that it does this thing. And I think that's a smart move on Shane Carruth's part, is not to have the character sit down and say, I know how to build a time machine. It's say, I'm going to build something. I mean, I think what they're trying to build is something that makes things have less weight, because that's what they're looking at measuring. And then they're astonished to discover that it has this other property, because as we are, that we don't have an explanation. They, as we, do not have an explanation for how anything they're doing with superconductors or magnetic fields would cause something to go backwards and forwards through time. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Right, so the part of you is not, yeah, everything is not exactly moving backwards, exactly the same. And, and, you know, that's another good line in the movie is, he says, are you sure this is safe? And he's like, there's no, I can't remember the exact line, but it's a great line where he says, there's no way I could possibly say that this is a safe device. All I know is I got in it and spent six hours in and I'm still alive. And yeah, I think that's their sort of recognition at that point. It's like, hey, yeah, we know everything could be weird and complicated or whatever. And I think the ear bleeds and the shaky hands and things like that are like, this is an accidental time machine. And uh, it's got some unexpected, unintended side effects. Even its main effect of being a time machine was unintended. Where's my, there's Alexis. Any, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a good. I think that's a good point. And they, they say that explicitly. Once the yeah. once the idea was out there, it couldn't be taken back. Yeah, that's the one thing that's truly permanent, in this is not the people, but it's the ideas. You 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 can't unring the bell. Yeah. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Well, you all were a little slow to get started, but we appreciate your engagement. Um, give Dr. Colwell a round of applause. He fielded our questions in a fantastic manner. Um, thank you all for coming to this installment of Science on Screen, and we hope to see you in the future. Um, check out our 13 films of Halloween. We've paired them with 13 cocktails for Halloween also, and um, continue to support independent film in Central Florida. Thank you. <laughs>